Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Studio 8.1, episode 59, with me, Jarvis Todd, uh, and my twin brother up there, Mr. Paul Skeldon, <laughs> yeah. uh, who is the editor in chief of Telemedia Magazine, Telemedia News, Telemedia Online, the voice of uh, global VAS uh, content, uh, payments, advertising, and messaging. And we are going to spend the next 20 minutes with you or so. Um, just going over some of the headline stories, which uh, we feel are the most interesting and uh, give you a slightly deeper dive into them. Now, uh, I should apologise in advance because this might be a longer episode than usual, because um, given, I suppose, the time of year, lots of uh, events now happening, not not least the um, uh, carrier billing uh, event, which was run uh, very, very, very well by uh, our friends MEF last week. And also, I think the wholesale show in Madrid. So, you know, the... The, the the wheels of PR have been moving quite quickly. Um, so we are going to be talking about um, some of those things that have come uh, from these events and uh, that we've seen in the news. And we're going to start off um, with a bit of a summary of the aforementioned uh, Carrier Billing Summit uh, or <laughs> and Alternative Payments, which now creates the hashtag GCBAPS, which I... <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and Paul did the hard yards. Uh, he was there for both days. I was there for one day. He's going to come back with some uh, overview on that. Um, there's also some uh, very interesting research that's come out over um, the last couple of weeks. Uh, the first bit talking about global subscriptions and that the sort of dynamics of that economy, which I think is really, really interesting. And there's certainly some elements of that which um, uh, I think will will ring true to, with everybody in our sector. Um, we're going to be talking about the growth of alternative payments, as uh, I mentioned earlier. Um, we're then going to be talking about, um, I suppose, the messaging landscape um, is constantly changing. And we've talked about OTT messaging and RCS a lot over the last couple of years, um, how that is impacting um, SMS uh, and particularly what uh, operators might be able to do about it um, and we are then going to have a quick summary um, to talk about the relevant areas I think um, at the World Telemedia Show which is coming up in Marbella in two weeks time uh, on the 6th, 7th and 8th of October if you have not bought your event pass please do now and join the 650 plus that have already done it so we'd like to see you there it's certainly going to be the place um, for our industry to meet, do business, learn, be inspired, uh, and uh, hopefully have a jolly good time as well. So without further ado, um, Paul, let's talk about the Carrier Billing Summit. Um, and I suppose what I noticed most really was I felt as though the content was far more on the button, really. And I think there's no uh, surprise because uh, the, the the wonderful Ansel Roberts did a brilliant job from MEF. I think they're taking more of a lead in there. So certainly the content seemed much more representative of what the industry needed to hear about. But I suppose most tellingly um, was that it's not just the Carrier Billing Summit anymore. And as we've alluded to, um, really, it's the way that Carrier Billing fits together with a range of other altern alternative payment mechanisms or methods, sorry, um, to enable merchants to offer the full range of payment um, at checkout, therefore reducing abandonment rate and also being able to uh, target the right customers with the right methods in the right territories. So tell, mm. give us your takeaways from last week's um, two-day event. Well, we're going to gallop through. I mean, obviously there was there was a ton of, of information. It was really good. It was very well put together. It had a lot of really interesting speakers Um and a lot of interesting sort of facts and, and a really sort of buoyant atmosphere, which was the thing that sort of really struck me. Last year's one was was quite a sort of buoyant. This one, a, a sense that it was, you know, this is a, a payment method that still has a great deal of mileage and is, is well, would appear to be growing. However, it did kick off with a, a somewhat sobering uh, presentation from Omdia, um, which did actually sort of looking at the, the nuts and bolts of the numbers that uh, carrier billing has sort of plateaued a bit after a sort of huge boost it got in um, during the pandemic, which is, I guess, where this all really changed. And it became a, a much more sort of mainstream payment method. Uh, so according to uh, Guillermo from Omdia, um, revenues on DCB are actually dropped by 8% year on year between 2022 and 2023. Um 
mainly because of a, a sort of tail off in its use in app stores. Um, growth in 2024 so far has been about 0.3%. So it is starting to, to, to increase again, albeit uh, slightly slower. Uh, just to put that in, in context, in 2020 during the pandemic, use uh, of DCB grew by 14% in a year, which was quite a sort of staggering leap. So yeah. that sort of got things off to a sort of curiously kind of uh, circumspect start, really. However, all, everyone else who appeared thereafter was really just um, sort of bigging up carrier billing uh, 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 and with many of the user cases and also this overriding or well, the two overriding things that came out of this for me was that one it's really mainstream and it's everywhere and two that it, it kind of is viewed as a payment mechanism that just works alongside others it's one of many uh, it has some advantages over some has some disadvantages compared to others but overall you know it, it's sort of horses for courses and that i think is the key to, to understanding this and why the show's now got this much longer name because it is part of this alternative payments world but just to sort of uh, pick out some of the highlights for me uh, i think one of the interesting things is the growth and use of carrier billing um and sort of ally to that premium sms uh, in europe um it's growing in germany it's being used as we've reported many times sort of extensively for all sorts of things the operators there have got together, they branded it, it appears all over the place. They're working, people like Domoco are working with this payment agent model so that it can be used for physical things. They're in bed now with Deutsche Telekom using carrier billing on Deutsche Telekom's uh, own uh, app store. Um, we also had a very interesting use case from Orange in France about um, using premium rate SMS to interact with um, TV gaming and voting. Is is I had a massive surge uh, uh, en France, um, and uh, he put out some really interesting figures that um, carry billing in France generated six hundred and fifty four million euros in twenty twenty three. 12% up on the previous year, and that 11.9 million users, that like tele telecoms users, are using carrier billing. But the caveat that 25% of the total sort of user base uh, actually blocked DCB, so, so three quarters of them, that's 11.9 million. Then he worked out that the ARPU, uh, so the average revenue per user of carrier billing in France is about 50 euros per user, which is, you know, uh, that's just an interesting and quite high level for something that's perceived in many ways as being a kind of you know fringe payment mechanism. Yeah. Well, um, you, could, you could also uh, understand why uh, France Telecom spend quite a lot of time um, converting their subscriber base to being able to use um, those services. Totally. I think he also mentioned, didn't he, that in order to be sort of super compliant and, and be considerate to their subscribers, they actually make it quite easy for them to opt out of those services. Well, that's, yeah, but equally, that's what I was coming to. Yeah, it, sorry. In the, no, 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 that's fine. This is, uh, I'm, I'm just rattling through it. But it I was awake we, during that session. If we discuss, you were awake in that one. Yes. Uh, but, uh, clearly taking notes. Um, but yes, what they have done there is to, to make it easier for people to use it by cutting down the number of steps involved in signing up to it. But like, as you say, making the opt out a very easy part of that. And, and likewise, making the opt in part of actually taking part. Yeah. So that rather than having to opt in and wait and then get to interact, vote, whatever it is, by, by agreeing to opt in, you then place your vote. So it removes a, a one that's vital of five steps makes it much more streamlined and this has, has really upped usage of it which comes to the other sort of interesting european uh well and i guess sort of uh, other other sort of more developed markets side of this that came out of it is that that how uh the industry and regulators and, and networks are now working much more collaboratively to work out how to how to regulate it and how to police it and how to make it so that you can protect consumers, but also make it easy to use. And I think for many years, back in the days when you and I both had hair, this was a, uh, you know, it, it, it was always viewed as being a bit dodgy and 
you know, regulated so strictly and like with like zero tolerance and sort of, you know, one person did something a bit wrong and the whole thing got shut down sort of for weeks. Yeah. Um, that attitude has gone completely out the window and it's now a much more collaborative uh, set up with regulators, industry bodies, networks, merchants, aggregators working together to work out how best to make this work. And this Orange France example is is an excellent example of that, how they've sat down and, and sort of thought, well, how can we make this so that it works? And they've removed like one step from the process, but saved a lot of time because a lot of people were trying to vote for things and it took so long to sort of um, opt in to do it that the vote had closed by the time they got to do it, which, you know, is a terrible user experience. Yeah. Um, so we've seen a lot of that. There was there was uh, talk from the uh, French regulator, uh, AF2M, about that, and Pay Info in Holland also discussed uh, at great length in one of their sort of panels about how they worked with the with the, um, the the operators to just make the whole process more streamlined. Um, similarly, in the sort of more developing markets in MENA, of course, we're seeing a, a, a huge growth in carrier billing that continues to be sort of seen as uh, as, a, as an important sort of payment tool because there's so many unbanked people it's a bit of a cliche that there's uh, so many unbanked people but to put it in perspective the guy from t-pay in turkey he has more people signed up to use carrier billing than all the banks in the region have people who can pay for stuff digitally mm-hmm. so it's a very powerful payment tool and as he said it it can be expensive relative to some of the other payment things, but it's really convenient and it reaches all these people. And that also came out in um, one of the other panel discussions about how even in places where there's sort of um, a 90 sort of percent sort of fee for using it, so the merchant only gets 10 percent of the of the of the charge, merchants still use it because it's it's 10 percent or nothing because they've got no other way of reaching these people. So it has this sort of potential to 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 be used there. The more people use it, the the lower those fees will be. As as we've seen in Europe, to make this sort of work, they've had to make it sort of so it's more competitive with credit cards. It's not as cheap, but it but it it becomes affordable because you're getting you're using it to onboard people you wouldn't have got otherwise. So you're making some revenue, not as much as you might do with credit card, but you then move them to it. The other interesting thing that came out of it is the 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 DCB sort of growth is slightly hampered by the rise of other alternative payment methods and the use of digital wallets in particular. But what we're starting to see in some countries is that people are using DCB to load their wallet. So it's a way of getting money into their digital wallet that they then use to pay for stuff. So while it might not be uh, carrier billing might be falling slightly from favour amongst app stores in particular because of this, because people are using wallets. It's actually not losing as much business as you might think because it's being used to top up the wallets that are then used to pay for things um, in app stores. So that's interesting. We're seeing growing use of uh, carrier billing for electric vehicle top ups, and that's a sort of global thing. And the more EVs appear in developing markets, the more that will grow, uh, and we're also seeing a lot of um, uh, a lot of people taking out insurance for various things using carrier billing as well uh, in in both developed and developing markets. And we're soon to see, I believe, um, across Africa, uh, carrier billing going to start to be used for utility payments. Wow! So a lot of bright uh, and interesting stuff to come. You know, to come. I think carrier billing is settling into where its role is. It does have some competition from other payment types, but it still seems to have a very good role to play and and one that all the people at this event, though obviously, you know, they work in that industry, so they're slightly biased, but the the mood was so positive around it. It was was incredible. If you think back 10 years, we we wouldn't probably have had this event, let alone be talking positively about carrier billing. It was all doom and gloom back then. It was. So, uh, well, thank you for that. And and I agree. I, sadly, I was only there for the first day. Uh, I missed the second. I also, um, going back to your point about collaboration with uh, regulators and operators, you know, it was very good to see so many regulators uh, on mm. the stand. And it was, and as you say, rather than them focusing on 
all the things you can't do and all the breaches and all the problems it was really quite a positive message coming from regulators and and and, and associations um particularly joanna cox who mm. as you rightly pointed out the uk market was, was regulated with an iron fist but actually she her very first sort of words were you know the uk is open for business in fact it's a great place to do business so you know i think you're right the legacy of the past um and 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 you know when when the industry was a bit wild west seems to really have gone and and as you say there are some fantastic applications uh, and um regulator environments do seem to be a bit more business friendly um and at least now trying to um find a balance between consumer protection and you know en enabling merchants to 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 be able to sort of maximize mm. engagement rates and, and more importantly conversion rates and as you say dcb will and should remain one of the best ways of actually acquiring a customer which is one of the biggest uh challenges for anybody in the digital world and then of course once you've acquired that customer and you've got their trust uh then you know it's not such a big it's not such a difficult thing to migrate them across to more convenient and, and, and more profitable payment mechanisms like for example credit card um which i think is why we're now talking about alternative payments uh, across the board rather mm. than really just focusing on dcb which certainly would would have been the only sort of payment mechanism in town in the telemedia space you know five years ago um of course one of the other things that dcb has been brilliant at um has been to um onboard people for subscriptions uh services and that's obviously a, a model that merchants like um, however, you know, it does come with its problems. And 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 very interestingly, the second story, I mean, I I I reference your excellent editorial with some very lovely literary um uh references, mate, by by the way. Um, Mark Twain <laughs> being one of them. But the, there was a there was a, a point we talked about sort of subscriptions and subscription bundling being a thing. Um, and uh, I think that they're predicted to be that 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 side of the business is going to be up by 2027 to 35 billion dollars um mm. and the next story um which as i say really struck a chord with me was um from forever subscriptions to vampire subscriptions research reveals conflicts in habits defining the global subscription economy and this is from uh uh bango who i think this is an update on the report they did last year about super mm. unbundling. sorry super bundling unbundling happened a long time ago um <laughs> super bundling global trends reports i think as i say i think this is the bango's sort of second or third version of this and it reads one in three americans now pay for a subscription they never use and 35 percent have lost track of how much they spend on subscriptions each month which makes american subscribers the most likely to lose track of their spending compared with the more cautious europeans who still come in at 28 percent, of which i am one uh, and those in Latin America who are just under there in it with 27 percent. So um, I thought this was really, really interesting, firstly, because I am exactly one of those people that subscribes to mm. an app, uses it once and then forgets all about it and continually writes in my diary that I must spend an afternoon unsubscribing to all these apps. <laughs> Uh, that I've got. And I love the idea of vampire subscription. I mean, that's just genius. Mm. So, you know, on the one hand, we talk about the benefits of subscriptions and and, and obviously in our industry, subscription revenues and, um, and acquiring customers on a subscription basis uh, is great for business. Um, although, interestingly, the whole issue of uh, the whole issue of subscriptions, if you go back five or six years, is more focused around the idea that people were unwittingly subscribing to stuff and then, you know, rogue, rogue uh, actors were actually ending up doing exactly this, taking money from people's phones without them really knowing about it. This is kind of the, you know, it's connected. The difference being that it's the user that's unwittingly, you know, or, or mm -hmm. which it has, 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 has subscribed and wants to subscribe, but they, you know, they've got you know sort of um bombarded with so much of this stuff that they lose the ability to be able to manage the subscriptions and as i say i'm exactly one of them so i wonder whether or not this is sustainable because i wonder whether or not people will start to just all of a sudden go that you know i'm not going to subscribe to anything because i know that I'm not convinced I'm going to use it. It'll probably, you know, fall off the, of my radar and it will just end up costing me money and become a vampire subscription. 
and goes back to what you've been was saying a long time ago, whereby actually the sort of snacking model where I make a one off payment might be certainly better for me. Um, if this becomes a really big problem, I suspect more people will be de you know, demanding that sort of service and perhaps pushing back on subscription offers. Uh, well, I think so. I think there, there, there's so much subscription offer. I mean, it's on everything. I and mean, obviously, like we tend to think of it in, in our industry as things around kind of uh, sort of, you know, video streaming and that sort of thing. But in, in life, I mean, you can subscribe to pretty much anything, can't you? Vitamins, food boxes, all sorts of stuff. Um, and, and so I think it does become a, a, a massive headache for, for the users. We all lose track of what it is. I think the idea of bundling is that you can see or, or it's a service operators can offer is like you can see all your subscriptions in one place and manage them um is the idea and that will hopefully get around these vampire and forever subscription sort of things you'll, you'll be on top of it i suspect not because like not who of us has time to really delve into that what is interesting and uh i i don't mean to blindside you but this happens just before we went on air but the, a survey has come out from junior for research about uh, how uh, young people uh gen z uh people are are much more into the idea of subscribing to certain things particularly things like um video streaming music streaming uh, yeah. and and broadband services uh and so they are actually well, that's because that's because they're not very good at managing their money <laughs> no well quite but they're the ones that, 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 are, that they're, they're sort of almost standing there waving their arms about saying i want bundling and i want super bundling and i want someone to do this for me and and uh it's an interesting sort of timing i think that this sort of study of what people because like you get to sort of our age group and, and we're very much not into that kind of thing but uh, it clearly has this impact on, on bundling, which is, is a sort of big deal, I think, for the value-added services market because it, it's suddenly not about individual services. It's about how to package these things up. And that comes back to the Carrier Billing Summit where they did talk quite a bit about subscriptions and about using Carrier Billing to uh, sign people up to subscriptions as a kind of onboarding thing, and then you switch them into like paying by card or bank transfer or... or sort of more convenient and easier to sort of do sort of uh, monthly payment but i think perhaps because of this vampire subscription idea maybe you know you need to have something more like your carrier billing doing your regular subscription because it's going to be much more sort of prominent i think you might see it more when you get your mobile phone bill and realize that it's higher than you kind of maybe were expecting then you realize it's because of these subscriptions but who, so, so, yeah. who looks at their mobile phone? Who who looks at their mobile phone bill anymore? I well, had... you might do. I mean, I don't know. I get texts. I get mine. Mine arrives, and I get a text alert saying your your new bill is ready, and it it says in the text message what what the breakdown of it is between the sort of spending and the handset and that kind of thing. Not like itemized, but it tells me that, I've, you know, it's costing yeah, me yeah, this yeah. much. In the old days, you, you'd get five or six pages all itemized. You could look yeah, but I think, but I think I'd get this text. You'll find that it. now. Yeah, but I'd look at this text message that would just appear and I'd think, why is that like so high? And then you think, oh yeah, it's my, my subscriptions. And then you, that then I think maybe inspires you to go, do you know what? I need to manage my subscriptions. I'll go into my operator portal and manage my bundle of subscriptions that they carefully manage for me. But I, I, I don't know. I'm just, it's just conjecture. But right. I think sort of what? younger people are going in that direction. So I think this might be one very interesting for value added services going forwards. And, and two, like it does have a carrier billing element to it. I'm, I'm, I'd be very surprised if somewhere in the world there isn't already some kind of legislation or regulation because um, around reclaiming subscriptions because, uh, as I understand it, given that initial um, s uh, statistic, one in so this isn't so one in three subscribers that I acquire as a merchant will pay for that subscription forever mm. that's that's what that implies for every mm. three subscribers i mm. board one of them will never ever ever leave me now mm. on the one hand that is an absolutely marvelous thing from my point of view um as a as, as a business 
Um, I would imagine that it, particularly in America, if a consumer says, well, look, you know, I have not used this service for 10 years and these guys have been taking $15 a month on, on my phone bill, I suspect that some kind of consumer protection will come in in those circumstances because mm. it, it, I don't see that being sustainable. Do you know what I mean? Because, yeah. you know, in a few years' time, somebody's going to say, actually, over the course of the last five years, I'm now thousands, thousands of dollars down for a service that I didn't, that I haven't used. And, you know, whilst I'm sure that all the terms and conditions are in place, I feel as though that is a massive problem the industry needs to deal with and, or, or, or there, there, there has to be regular reminders that you're a subscriber and, mm. and, and, you know, that you haven't used your service and would you like to unsubscribe? Because I feel like there's, you know, that that's not sustainable. One in three subscribers being, being there forever. So I, I, no, I would it's... imagine that there is some legislation and some rules and regs around this sort of stuff. And it'd be quite interesting to get a bit more detail, but I, I, I don't know. What do you, what do you? Yeah, think? no, it's something. No, it's definitely something to to look at. And I think not just like I say, uh, not just across the sort of uh, services we deal with, but across all things. Because I think the more uh, like all retailers of all sorts of things are trying to sell this idea of subscriptions because it's a nice guaranteed regular, uh, you know, sort of income and cash flow. But I think as that sort of if we move to a kind of very much subscription model for most things, yes this problem just becomes massive. And yeah. I think, yeah, they, there has to be more done. I think you're right. It's not that just that message saying, uh, you know, you, you, you have subscribed to this service. It's about actively going, you haven't used it for, you know, two months. Do you want to unsubscribe? And I think that that's sort of a really difficult message for a business to send out. But I think, yeah, it's one that needs to be done or all this all just sort of implodes doesn't it eventually yeah. when everyone refuses to do subscriptions because it's seen as a scam yeah 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 it's the it's the subscription elephant in the room lurking yeah. in the shadows and uh well no doubt when when uh when it does happen when the chaos happens we will have to cover that in uh in, well yeah i'm gonna yeah so i'm gonna go off and find out some more about that because i think that's a really interesting uh aside to it i think it's a sort of uh, i think it's you're right it's going to become really important uh, i think okay. you know we need to flag that up well there you go and as i say particularly in america well let's move on um i mean still sort of along the same same lines in the in the sort of umbrella term we are part of the e-commerce m-commerce uh world if you want to use that as the umbrella and um, some more stats from uh, the mighty Juniper from their uh, global e-commerce payments market report, uh, which is covering 2024 to 2029. And you can download a free copy of that uh, in the link on our podcast page. Um, and their predictions are that the e-commerce market is poised to reach 11.4 trillion by 2029, um, driven by, as we alluded to earlier, the 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 rise uh, of alternative payment methods, APMs uh, across. Mm, APMs. The uh, interestingly, um, that in five years, we're going to go from 7 trillion, where we, which is where we are now, um, by another. So it's, 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 a, it's a big old growth. That's well over 50% in five years. Um, that's a lot of trillions to be getting uh, your hands mm. on, uh, people. Um, so, yes, in fact, it's a 63% growth in the next five years. It was the, the, the percentage was given to us. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a lot of this, as I said, um, seems to focus on the rise of APMs. And, of course, as you mentioned earlier, the real hotbeds for uh, alternative payments and DCB and all that kind of stuff are the developing markets. Although um, I liked what you said last week, that we shouldn't be calling them developing. We should be calling them, what was what was the word? Evolving, I evolving, think. Uh, yeah, yeah, I evolving think markets. Because, developing yeah. is they've developed, I think. They're evolving now. Well, I think so. I think they're evolving. I think all of them are evolving. I think they're just at different stages. I mean, I threw yeah. this one in but really, really as an illustration of like how alternative payments are becoming really significant. Um and why the Carrier Billing Summit is now the Carrier Billing and Alternative Payments Summit. Um, because, you know, e-commerce is huge, sort of driven by that figure. A lot of that is driven by alternative payments in these evolving markets. Uh, part of that is going to be an opportunity for Carrier Billing, even if it is just using Carrier Billing to top up your wallet to, to buy these things. And for subscriptions, which form a big part of the growth of e-commerce. 
So it's um, it's uh, yeah, it's a, just a little aside, really. This one as a sort of illustration of uh, what we were talking about around the carrier building summit. Well, yeah, and and, I, I, and and good to add it in uh, big figures and growth. Um, we we'll, <laughs> big numbers and growth is what we want to talk about. Um, it, the only thing I would say on this is that, that, that you know Juniper put these reports out to industry on a regular basis. They're an excellent company, uh, and the conclusion read: uh, PSPs can maximise these conversion rates by partnering with local payment companies that have in-depth knowledge and in consumer of consumer preferences, and support regional payment options. And I thought to myself, state the bleeding obvious. Um, and it just sort of goes to show, and I sort of scratched my head a little bit, thinking, you know, does this mean that telemedia has always been well ahead of its time? Or of course. Does, does this age-old message need to be continually repeated because there are lots of new people coming to the market that wouldn't have actually that wouldn't have actually occurred to? But you know, I I think if you go back to sort of 2015 2016 where we we really decided to um put the world back in world telemedia and start to take um a, a more international view of the industry which is really where we sh should always have been and it, it was always an industry which uh relied on stealth and being mm -hmm. able to uh operate cross border and, you know, the simple message about dealing with a local partner to understand, you know, the certain billing mechanisms, network rules and regulations, content preferences, marketing channels, you know, it, it kind of pretty obvious. Right. That, that and, and yeah, I just thought it was kind of interesting that, you know, Juniper, who are a really brilliant company, you know, have to sort of continually put put um, sort of very sort of obvious statements and, well, and you hear it though, out, as conclusions the, I, I wonder i wonder well, all the is... conferences you go to you hear this all the time about yeah. uh, localization or having local experts i think um i mean the world of, of everything is sort of becoming globalized i think people lose sight of the fact that that that's great from a sort of conglomerate perspective but if you're actually trying to do business in a particular region you need someone on the ground who knows what what's what but i think that that's a huge opportunity for us isn't it because we end up with all the the local players from across well the world at uh, yeah. our events who are there to be able to say to, to the people the merchants looking to expand into these markets well we can help you do this yeah no absolutely i, I um, think you're right it's all the young people that are joining the industry that's uh, no not, they have no clue they have no clue. they have no clue like us old hands who are very old and experienced and I'd tell you what they wise do. and I tell you what they they know about um high tech modern messaging um platforms and uh, yes yes every people it's that time of the episode where we talk about RCS and I'm delighted to announce that I have finally received you, one oh I excellent. finally received one in fact they I got numerous ones all in one go i think that somebody's been listening in uh the bank um the the local surgery um, so yeah, it is. It is starting to. It is starting to filter through, um, and it's also doing some quite annoying things on my phone, where it's popping up on top of the screen, and it's it's actually really driving me mad. But anyway, um, so so good news, RCS. You you heard it here first. It, it really it really is here to stay now. Um, the next story is talking about. Um, you know, we've talked about how um, alternative messaging. Um, is potentially ringing the sort of death knell to SMS. Um, and, you know, that's obviously bad news for the operators. But this story talks about, actually, there is still an opportunity for operators and they, they need to sort of pull their finger out. And the, 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 the secret is, as the story goes, communications APIs such as RCS will generate 35 billion for operators globally by 2027. Paul, explain how is this going to improve the operator's um, well, because they can situation. sell it, can't they? They can sell it. They can use AI to generate uh, conversational uh, sort of RCS messages uh, for businesses and sell businesses those messages slightly more per message than they can with SMS, which uh, is being used slightly less. Therefore, their SMS revenues are, uh, are dipping. They now have this opportunity with things like RCS and other application program interfaces. Uh, or APIs, as everyone knows them, uh, to, to create sort of, you know, a revenue stream or continue their revenue stream around messaging. And I think the, 
the real takeaway from this is while SMS appears to be declining, but we'll come to that in a moment. Um, you know, the, the operators have to leverage things like RCS and rich messaging and AI, particularly these large language models, things like chat GPT and the like, to offer a, uh, I guess, an AI pad automated sort of messaging services to um, businesses or to okay. aggregators to sell to businesses. Again, it's sort of very much, if you work in this industry, it's fairly obvious. Um, and, and I think, you know, it, no one needs to be told to do it. It's just a sort of evolution of where messaging is going anyway. I mean, RCS is really sort of a, a sort of evolution in to all intents and purposes of SMS. It's sort of SMS 2.0. It works differently and it's a different platform, but essentially from a user perspective, it will slowly replace mm. SMS as we know it. Not say I doubt the things that annoy people like you and I, uh, by kind of taking over your phone and it not being done in the old fashioned way. Um, but but yeah, so it's so really it's it's a matter that that SMS revenues are starting to decline, but there are alternative ways of doing this. Operators are just increasingly starting to have to create a more rich and complex messaging offering as a product to sell on. Um, which sort of brings us neatly to uh, the other two stories where SMS is actually uh, getting a bit of a boost. And, a, and a, another opportunity for you to uh, make your Mark Twain reference. The death of yes. SMS has been greatly exaggerated. Absolutely. You've obviously, got, you've obviously joined a book no. club. <laughs> yeah, I need to get, um, yes, I need to but, buy another book. <laughs> yeah, so the two stories Paul's referring to, um, it's it kind of ironic, I suppose, um, when, when we've been talking about um, uh, the, the threat to SMS from other messaging platforms, when you had two stories which which run um, very straightforward, not not much for us to say here, but go for mobility, have teamed up with Horizon uh, to beef up the bulk SMS for its telecom, media and mobile clients. Uh, very, very, very happy to say that both of those companies will be very high profile in Marbella. So if that doesn't show you that um, World Telemedia is also strong on the messaging side of things, um, that then I don't know what does. So please remember, go to wtevent.com and uh, register now. And if you do, you will appear uh, and be able to access the live delegate list on our 8.1 platform. You'll be able to click on every individual uh, participant. Um, you'll be able to view their profiles and you'll be able to communicate with them directly in whatever um whatever sort of mechanism they have added to their profile so um do remember to do that the earlier you do the more um pre-show meetings you can organize and, and perhaps even the the more meetings you can work out you don't want it more importantly the ones you shouldn't be having um so you know we, we pre-qualifying pre-qualifying those meetings is always a good idea i think um the second, well, I mean, do you want to do you want to add anything on that? Well, no, I mean, this and, and the second story uh, sort of go hand in hand, I think, in, in, and off the back of this idea that SMS revenues are declining, which they are. There's still a massive market for SMS. Well, tell uh, us about um, the you tell us about the second story. You, you, you well, the, sec the second story is, is just I just put it in there because I think it's just once again sort of demonstrates that SMS is still really important, and it's Phonics, our friends at Phonics, who who are working now with uh, Just Giving, who are a uh, charity uh, here in the UK, uh, just to use sort of SMS for for people to make easy donations, a nice, simple, straightforward SMS donation process. Uh, the Horizon Go for Mobility story, Go for Mobility are working with Horizon to beef up uh, their bulk SMS offering again for I think things around sort of media interaction and um, services with telcos and all that kind of thing, which brings us neatly back to sort of where we started with how um, premium SMS in France is uh, booming around uh, TV interaction. You think we're, we're suddenly sort of starting to see these things are really back on the agenda. So SMS for charity, PSMS for. TV interaction yeah. in France, bulk SMS across sort of media and telco companies uh, that uh, work with Go for Mobility. I think this is this is strong and strong. interesting. So despite RCS being uh, uh, sort of built into uh, Apple's messaging as of uh, last week, um, SMS is still very much a potent force for these kind of things. There's a lot of uh, a lot of mileage in it, and I think we might see a bit of a surge in uh, these sorts of 
services because I think sort of younger people, people sort of under about sort of 15, don't realise that you can sort of do this kind of thing mm. with messaging. They're so used to eye messaging each other mm. uh, and Snapchat messaging each other. They don't realise that there's ways of interacting with the TV and stuff through through messaging, which they don't realise it's SMS. They don't need to know that. But oh. uh, I think, you know, we are going to sort of see a, a kind of retro interest in this kind of stuff. And it's easy. It works. The technology is so proven uh, you know, the likes of Phonics have been doing this kind of thing for years and years, and they just hone it and refine it and make it better and better. And and still, you know, uh, charities in particular, like Just Giving, are signing up with them to do it because it works. Well, I know that the um, when Phonics started to really sort of lead the way with regards to UK charity donations uh, using PSMS with the likes of Children in Need, that, you know, they, they put the increase the significant increase in donations down to being able to offer premium sms and i believe i i think the statistics are now sort of hugely in favor of of, of psms in, in, in versus all other donation mechanisms so i'm 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 not so well i'm i'm sort of surprised that just giving have taken so long to jump on board and i'm sure it's going to um i'm sure it's going to make a significant difference to their um, success as well so uh, well done phonics um and let's yeah. um you know look forward to hearing some some big numbers this time next year as a result of that um, partnership um we just better be quick now and finish up by saying uh, you know we uh, we've mentioned that um most of the topics and issues that um, we discuss uh, are played out in real life in real business uh during the upcoming world telemedia show six to eight of uh october in uh, Marbella. This is now the uh, one of a biannual set of events because, as you know, we're going to the Middle East and to Dubai uh, in May 11th, 12th and 13th. That's going to be interesting given the uh, changing landscape and, and, and challenges that I think that region is now facing. So um, all the more reason to, uh, to to put that in your diaries. But um, what you can expect from World Telemedia Media is, is uh, 650 to 700 business hungry, information hungry sea level decision makers uh all um enjoying some good weather and some great business but there is also uh the, the, there is also an information side of the of, of the show which i just think it would be useful to um to highlight what's going on so we're going to have a, a, a one main conference track this year uh, which is going to open up uh, we mentioned that um, Anzel Roberts uh, had uh, Robertson, sorry, had done a, a fantastic job of running the DCB event. Whilst they were there, they did a uh, operator survey, uh, mm. and we are our, our, our attendees are going to get the an exclusive um, opportunity to see the results of that survey, and that's going to be presented by Anzel at ten thirty on the Tuesday. We're then going to break out into is that, is that this. That no, I don't know if it's that. That's something else, isn't it? That's, I think that's uh, something that, that's, else. This is yes, yeah, this that, is an operator survey. Put that away. Yeah, that's very good. That is. That's Put a that good away. Okay. That one. <laughs> we're then going to be talking about. Uh, we're then going to be talking about um, uh, user acquisition, and we've got uh, uh, you will be you'll be sharing that with um, Reality cool. Plus Tony Pierce. They're going to be talking a lot about games and how um, the uh, the. The various sort of um, mechanisms now uh, are, are pre presenting big challenges for um, um, marketeers and, and merchants to acquire acquire um, uh, customers. And I think it's a, a big theme throughout the the the, the event. Uh, we're then going to be talking about um, what people uh, the, the the classic seriously fresh media uh, session, which is really talking about who's buying what, what content's hot, what's not. Um, and also looking at some new models there in terms of uh, the VAS sector, but that's going to be mainly content. We've got Hungama coming into that one and Perpetuum Media. We're also going to be talking about piracy, which apparently is going to become a problem. And um, yeah. so I think that's yeah. going to be quite a lively debate. Um, we then got the afternoon sessions. We're very lucky to have a, a Google sponsored session. And Google will be presenting best practices for Google Ads. Uh, which will then uh, uh, be followed by a sponsored session by Message, which will be and Google will join them, uh, and uh, they'll be talking about how to um, outcompete in a crowded market, um, specifically with regards to MVAS services. So that's um, going to be a very good session. We're going to then um, look at SMS actually as a as a marketing route. Um, interesting that we've been sort of talking about the decline of SMS, but actually. 
you know, given some of the challenges, particularly with regards to Google. Um, we've got um, SMS Edge, uh, who believe that um, uh, SMS messaging could well be um, a resource that needs to be, you know, revisited, I think, by many marketeers mm -hmm. in our sector. Um, and then we're also going to be looking at the sort of practical um uh, the sort of practicalities of whether or not um, you can accelerate your growth um, by using agencies mm -hmm. and Sam agency are going to explain why they uh, well where they add the value and that might be a good session for anybody that's looking to market services um, we're going to be talking about AI, AI phone calls uh, the future of voice messaging again sorry voice marketing again we, you know we talked about this a couple of weeks ago with regards to voice having a, a a part to play particularly with ai and 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 i'm going to be really interested to see how you know the the goodies are using that uh, because we talked about how um it was not necessarily going to be a force for good for the fraudsters um but you know i did mention to you that voice marketing was um, certainly a successful tool and i guess you know, it will be interesting to find out how that is monitored and 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 used as a as a sort of genuine source of marketing rather than as a um, you know potential potential scam uh, a tool for scam. So anyway, that's going to be good. And then we've got a big uh, DCB session. I mean, given that DCB was covered so so well by the MEF session before, I think um, you know just a couple of hours in our particular track. But again, I think the illustration is very much going to be how DCB um, is uh, part of a wider alternative payment mechanism in the mm -hmm. environment for the telemedia business. Uh, and, it, you know, we're going to be covering things like mobile wallets as well, uh, credit card. You know, we talked about DCB being a, a user acquisition tool uh, and we've got some. Um, uh, we've got uh, Mobile Arts, uh, who have been very prominent over the last couple of years, sort of leading the way with that one. Uh, and then following it up by, with a sponsored session by uh, Solaris, who I think you met in uh, in, in, in Amsterdam, um, and talking about, you know, embracing other forms of um, uh, uh, payment mechanisms as well. Um, and then we've got a, a, a panel discussion with Dynamic Mobile Billing and Sam Billing to uh, round all that off. Um, just on that, there's a white paper from Solaris that's come out, Paul. Have we, go, are we going to put a link to that on the? Uh, we will do shortly. Well, it's, uh, it's um, I think it's out now, isn't it? It was, uh, I did some work with them on um, a piece that's in the magazine that's coming out, so the telemedia magazine that's coming out, but uh, alludes to uh the content of that i'm uh, waiting to get to my link to the uh, report but that's that will be up we'll be talking about that in more detail online shortly okay good um okay. and then yep yeah, they'll be at the show because yes i think they make they form an interesting part of this idea that dcb is part of a, of a bigger payment picture and, and how to use dcb and how to migrate people to other payment mechanisms how to make that all work and manage all that uh is uh, yeah they're really interesting they're, they're a really interesting company as you know we had lunch um, with and, okay, just good. the other day so if everyone should keep an eye out for that we'll be putting yeah. it out to that shortly and the last two sessions of the day we're going to be looking at those developing markets uh <laughs> africa um which is being sponsored by uh the wonderful world play uh we've got a fantastic panel there which will give everybody a great overview about the opportunities in 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 that wonderful continent and uh and then we're going to follow that up quite fittingly uh with a, a session uh, that's called understanding the middle east and it's a wt25 dubai sort of summit really because i think that you know the key there is not only to talk about the the factors that people need to be aware of in terms of of doing business in the Middle East, and I suppose, as I say, not least the the sort of political landscape at the moment, um, but also it would be an opportunity for us to sort of create an agenda uh, going forward for the uh, World to the Media Show in Dubai in May. So uh, that's a, a real kind of highlight and a nice way to wrap wrap up uh, World to the Media Marbella. Um, so uh, I, I think we've spoken for long enough, Paul. It's been a, a yeah, it's been a fulsome and lengthy. It really wow. has. It really has. Um, so I hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, I guess the next time we'll do this will be after the show. So we'll be full of um, well, media. Well, sch uh, schedule wise, we should be doing it live at the show, but I don't think that's probably going to happen. Well, let's so, talk about uh, that. The next one will be after the show, I think, with all the stuff that we uh, get there. So it might be even longer. 
Oh my gosh. Okay, well listen, thanks very much, mate, for your time. Uh thank you Always for a pleasure. listening, everyone. And um do send us comments if you have any. And remember, keep keep your news stories coming uh, our way because we can't really survive unless we hear of uh you know, if you've got a good story to tell, you tell it to us and we'll make yeah. sure everyone else knows about it. Absolutely. Thanks good very to hear much. your feedback as well. We want to hear yeah. what you have to say. So. Absolutely. So we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time and uh, hopefully see you in Marbella, everyone. Absolutely.